As it turned out, we did get to go home, but not for the reason I'd hoped. When I called back to report this latest wrinkle, I was told in no uncertain terms that the forest was off limits. No stepping foot past the wall for any reason. Why? I asked. Beside me, Anne gestured for me to explain the one-sided conversation. I held up a hand for her to wait. Is it dangerous? Only in the legal sense, Jasmeet told me. Property law here is vicious. Without permission, it would be like starting a war. I really should have known that. So let's get permission. Working on it, he said. Come on back if you're done. We just got reports about two other loose animals, and we've sent a team out. This isn't looking good. People think it's our fault. I was afraid of that, I said. I ended the call and told Anne the further bad news. She complained while I did my best to wedge the broken fence bits back into place. Still going strong on the way back to the truck, she only paused to say goodbye to the remaining locals as we passed. Reed and Paul didn't have to ask before Anne brought them into the loop. I can't believe they think this is our fault. I mean, I can, but come on, really? Anne griped as we all buckled in, getting blue cinnamon grass stains on the seats. I hope we find the person responsible soon, because I have words for them. She finished ranting so she could drive with the proper amount of attention for a vehicle full of traumatized rabbits. I spent the ride watching out the windows for any signs of animals that shouldn't be there. Didn't spot any, but I did see a new mural going up that I'd missed earlier, a glorious galaxy scape along the cobblestoned side of a bookstore. A pair of artists were sketching out spaceships with a distinctly earthling design, soaring between octagonal windows and the low roof. That painting would be spectacular when it was done. I hoped they didn't regret their choice of subjects. When we rolled into park, multiple assistants were waiting to help unload. More than a few people had been called in for extra shifts, so this wouldn't be all on the regular crew's overtime. It was a lot of cages and a lot of checkups. I was intensely grateful that we four didn't need to do all of it. Keep an eye on this one, I said, handing over the little black rabbit. It might have been just heat exhaustion, but this guy collapsed like a cake in the sun. It seemed alert enough now. I crossed my fingers about germs and parasites. Once the truck was empty, I went to check in with the boss before heading home. The next shift could handle the cleanup without me. They did it every day whether or not there were umpteen strange animals to quarantine. I made sure to scrub my shoes on the antibacterial mud mat and grab more hand sanitizer as I left. Shell was in her office, just wrapping up a video call on the large wall screen. She had a body type that was more Turtle Dillo-like than I would ever say out loud, the complexion of someone who lived indoors, steely gray hair, and currently a matching expression. Thanks for checking, she said to the screen, waving me in. Goodbye. Good luck, replied a female voice. Before the screen went blank, it held the improbable image of a human with waves of black hair drifting like she was underwater. A pencil floated past the camera. As she moved to grab it, someone behind her clung upside down to the back wall, digging into an open panel of high-tech controls. The screen blinked off. I stared. Was that the space station? I asked. What's up with their gravity? Some glitch in that sector. Shell said with a sigh. They're apparently having trouble with hooligans fighting the cops and breaking things, which sounds like all kinds of fun. But they aren't missing any animals. I expected as much. But I had to check when I got the chance to reach a colleague. Now, how did it go catching bunnies? I gave her a rundown that she accepted with her usual calm, barely wrinkling her nose at the way I was probably making her office smell like incense. She thanked me for my hard work and said that all the relevant authorities were being contacted. Soon enough, she waved me out the door to go home. I didn't have to be told twice. Tired though I was, I smiled when I reached the single-story parking garage that held my chosen mode of transportation. A turtle dillo hover chair in the biggest size I could find without commissioning something special. It sat between regular cars like a prank. More than one co-worker had asked if I wanted something more practical, but no, I did not. I'd wanted a hover chair since I'd first arrived and seen the locals zipping around on them like seated scooters. The things were designed for the short-legged turtle dillos to sit while comfortably reaching the handlebars. But child-sized or not, the hover chairs were great fun, so I made it work.
Specifically, I sat cross-legged on the beanbag seat and leaned back so my elbows didn't stick out sideways. Even exhausted and covered in scratches, it made me grin. Dignified, no. But effective, yes. I sped out of the parking garage past slower cars, fully aware of the looks I was getting. I'm pretty sure that it was about the same level of absurdity as if a giraffe on Earth had taken to riding scooters. Or maybe one of those tiny, fuel-efficient cars with its head stuck out the roof. Yeah, it was probably about that silly. But only if giraffes were normally thought of as solemn diplomats, I thought as I drove. Giraffes are already a little bit silly. Every other local I talk to comments on how I'm not as serious as they expected. I guess if all they have to go on is the official videos, that does make sense. The trade agreement between our worlds was still a new thing. There was more interaction now than ever, but every human visitor went through rigorous screening and training to make sure nobody screwed things up. We thought, before we spoke, we were well-versed in local customs, and we made sure none of the rockbacks would be insulted by the comparison to random fauna before any of us ever said turtle dillo to them. A certain level of dignity just came with the territory. But there's dignity. And then there's dignity, I thought as I took a corner at high speed, freeing a hand to make a cocky salute towards several young adults who were likely to appreciate the sight. They did. I heard the exclamations as I drove away. Surely that looked cooler than a giraffe, I thought, possibly approaching gangly dragon on a motorcycle. As fun as this was, my thoughts danced around worries about the way our reputation could suffer from this bizarre animal situation. A new alliance was a fragile one. It was all I could do to stay upbeat while I drove. Preoccupied, I navigated the roads toward the housing complex on the far side of the massive Earth embassy. I could have taken internal roads to get there, but this was actually faster not to mention more interesting. My first couple of weeks had been spent cooped up in buildings designed to be as human-friendly as possible. While they were that, no short doorways to be found, they were also deadly boring when there was a whole alien world outside to explore. I jumped at the chance to venture out as soon as I'd been allowed. Now I had full permission to go where I would. And I loved it. Seeing the sights and interacting with the locals was an endless joy, without fail. I stopped at an intersection behind a pair of single-person hover cars, both painted a dark salmon pink. Everything here was familiar but different in the details, from the popular car colors, no white, to the traffic lights, symbols instead of colors, to the well-tended plant life everywhere. A gardening crew was pruning a public fruit tree across the street, making sure those bushy green branches remained in easy reach when the next batch of red fruits grew in. The tiny fence around it, barely a hand span tall, made sure no fruits rolled into the road. Other trees peeked over the low buildings farther ahead, planted just for the aesthetic. Looking upward around here gave me an excellent view of the sky, with just enough greenery to accent any cloud structures we had going. There were no canyons of skyscrapers here. If turtle dillos needed extra space, they dug down instead of building up, and their structures weren't very tall to begin with. Another car pulled in behind me, this one with the windows open and peppy music playing. I smiled at the tune. The driver immediately changed it to talk radio, and my smile was gone. Drone footage has caught sight of Earth animals that we don't know the name of yet, declared the radio. Was this an exciting new shipment that they were about to announce to the public? Or something more sinister? It went downhill from there. What is going on, I thought. Who could have even brought the animals here? A zebra of all things. They must have some quality stasis chambers to keep that kind of finicky beast healthy. I knew that the spaceways were open to anyone, though we really were out in the boonies here. Only Terminus Space Station was a reasonable distance away. It was the nearest human habitation, our closest link to home. And it was apparently plagued with gravity problems and riots against the cops. That wasn't normal either. Is there a connection? I wondered, as the light changed from a diamond to a crescent, and the cars in front of me hummed away. I hate not knowing. There's nothing I can do to fix this. I drove my scooter across the intersection with professional posture, not turning my head or giving a hint that I'd overheard the extremely loud radio. The air was full of flowers and distant music. This really was a lovely drive home. I wanted to keep doing this instead of getting sent back to Earth in disgrace as the whole alliance crumbled. If only I knew what's happening at the space station, I thought.
Surely that would help.